welcome everybody to the SMW Pulse podcast. This segment of the Pulse is about entrepreneurship, entrepreneurs, their stories, um, their characters, their backgrounds, and we are going to be teasing out from um, some of our friends um, the trials and tribulations of growing a business. This is the first, and we've got David Spence Percival with us today. Um, who's going to be telling us about his story. We're following a bit of tradition with David. Um, when I first joined Smith & Williamson many moons ago, we started a speaker series that you might remember. I do. Do you remember this? I do, and look at me looking young there <laughs> and uh, very ambitious. Yes. <laughs> Hello, Nick. How are you? Yeah, I'm really good. So, <laughs> so what I've just put in front of David... Wow, what is the date of that? It looks like 1950. <laughs> it's dated, that, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So this was an event that we did that was titled Selling My £100 Million Business and Starting All Over Again. And the reason we got David to speak is we thought that was lunacy. He's done it again since then. <laughs> so he's now selling Proving his, his second £100 million business and starting all over again. So we're going to be teasing yeah. out a bit of that. And then there's a new, even more exciting, I might argue, business on uh, in fruition at the moment. Mm -hmm. So without further ado, David, how did it all start? Which one? <laughs> well, can we go a bit further back? Tell yeah. us what your very first ever job was. Uh, I was a petrol pump attendant okay. in the days where people used to uh, have their cars filled by petrol pump attendants. <laughs> um, it wasn't the 1950s, it was the 1980s, <laughs> um, but there was still a few around. And do you know what? It was great. I mean, these cars pulled up, you fill them with petrol, and you got a tip, and you got to meet some cool people, and sometimes some pretty women, and you know, as a teenager, it was just a great job, really. So that was a school job? Uh, yeah, and I remember getting twelve pounds a week, and I, I really thought I was so rich because I'd never had any income. I'd had five pounds a week pocket money, right. and suddenly I was getting twelve pounds a week, and I just thought, yeah, it was great. I loved it. So, what what age were you then? What were you doing with your twelve pounds? Was it a weekend spend? We're spending it, yeah. Um, were you a dandy mostly, then? Yeah, yeah, mostly. <laughs> no, no. Do you know what? I think it was more of it. It was very social back then. In yeah. The sort of uh, early eighties. You know, you'd, you'd probably go to your local pub. You'd probably turn out of your local pub when it closed and went and got, you know, a kebab or a burger or something and mm -hmm. then sort of messed around and then went to bed. You know, that was just sort of the right passage. So for me, yeah, it was just having a great time of the weekends, going yeah. to school or going, you know, um, is that, actually that was after school. And then, and then during school, then after school, I went, uh, left at 16 and went straight to work with Lloyds Bank. Oh, right. Okay. So straight in. And what were you doing at Lloyds then? Well, I started off as a trainee, and then I became their youngest ever cashier at uh, sort of 16, right. and, which is a bit terrifying looking after people's money. Um, but yeah, I enjoyed it. I thought it was quite cool. Um, but I was stuck in this kind of provincial town, Lloyd's Bank, and I had four employees, would you believe? Okay. Chorley Wood Branch. And it was absolutely <laughs> tiny. I'm pretty sure it's not still open. And I kept requesting a uh, transfer to London. I wanted to go to the city, you know, as everybody did in the 80s. Um, and they transferred me to Wilsdon Green. Um, I started out in London. And yeah, <laughs> yeah which so I, can I wouldn't call it the <laughs> epicenter of finance, um, but I certainly learned a lot about bad debt um, and uh, met some very, very interesting people. And yeah, I mean, I enjoyed it. I mean, uh, and then I, and then I left uh, when I was about eighteen. Okay, to do. I, to the horror of my parents, I went to work in fashion um, because those <laughs> days you got a job in a bank because you got really cheap mortgages because mortgage rates are so high. And my parents said, what on earth are you doing? You know, you need to get a cheap mortgage. And I said, I'm just interested in getting a mortgage. You know, I want to go and have fun and, and, and go and work in fashion. So I worked in a clothes shop in Bournemouth, of all places. And um, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know why, I just did. And, and How? I, I, just, I found it really, really good fun. You know, yeah. you get to wear kind of clothes that you want to wear. You meet all the sorts of people you want to meet. Eventually, I moved up and, and worked in a couture sort of fashion house in Covent Garden. And had a, you know, I really enjoyed it. I did it until I was 26 years old. Oh, really? Yeah. So what were, you, what were you doing there? Were you a sort of personal well, shopper? Well, I just kind of, and... no. I worked my way up. I was a sales assistant and I was sort of, you know, floor manager, then manager, and then looking after the fashion shows and stuff. And, and, and then you get to sort of do styling for, I don't know, Rolling Stones and Depeche Mode and all stuff like that. It got quite glamorous, actually. There's no money in it, but it was incredible. <laughs> you, got, you went to all the best parties and looked fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> you know, hang around with models all day, it was great, um, but never had any money. Um, and then, and then, uh, literally, overnight almost, I, I met my now wife um, when I was 26. Yeah. And she was um, 47. Okay. And I asked her out, 
And she laughed at me and she said, you're far too young, you can't afford me. <laughs> can't Which afford is true, you can't, can't afford her now. So it's all her fault. <laughs> <laughs> it's your so, uh, uh, but at that point, I thought I'd better grow up. So I left fashion and went to work in recruitment. Okay. Um, astonished I got the job because I didn't even have a decent suit. I had long hair. I mean, I looked, you know, I was just in fashion. And the guy, I think, felt a bit sorry for me and gave me the job. And about 18 months later, I was running the office and fired him. I think I was, oh, nice. <laughs> I think I was, I was fishing around the internet and I saw picture of you in quite a oversized suit with slightly too long hair is that that are we in that era now that was the fashion, <laughs> <laughs> was the fashion 1988 89 I think you, yeah you're pulling it off quite yeah. well <laughs> it's quite a dandy then yeah, yeah. <laughs> Covent Garden was really cool actually I worked on Neil Street and at that time Neil Street really was the sort of epicenter of everything to do with fashion and music at mm -hmm. that time um, so yeah, I had a great time, but as I say, then I sort of grew up a little bit. So you grew up into recruitment. So yes. So what, what, what's day one of that look like when you turn up to that office? Pretty tough, actually. I mean, it's a fairly relentless business. Yeah. You get a lot of rejection, a lot of you know objection handling going on, because you're literally cold calling for business, mm. picking up jobs and trying to fill them. I very, very quickly realised, though, that the only way to make um, good money in recruitment is to be a niche recruiter. Okay. So I sort of worked it out pretty quickly and then became quite successful quite quickly after about 18 months. Mm. I was driving around in a brand new Aston Martin earning, you know, 25,000 quid a month. I mean, it was just one of those sort of <laughs> yeah. stratospheric rises. I think what happened was I thought, oh, I like this. This is really, I can do this, you mm. know, and I, I just threw myself into it. Working, I worked every Saturday for the first six months alone in the office, no one else in there. I just knew I could do it. I got yeah. quite excited by it. And then, yeah, that was the first job. And was that the bug? Because I guess that's the first time you saw <laughs> efforts turn into cash in pocket. So that was the start. Yeah, I think up until that point, I wasn't that interested in money. But I think after that point, I certainly was, because I realized it, it, it um, so I got, went from becoming a bit of a socialist to a bit of a capitalist. Yeah. And, and realized that, yeah, months. almost overnight. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then, yeah, I realised that it, it, it gave you this extraordinary life. I mean, I worked really, really hard, yeah. but the rewards came. And I think it must be really frustrating if you work really hard and the rewards don't come. In this instance, they did. So I think that's what sort of turned me onto money, if you like, yeah. um, and the success of that bought. I kind of slightly resented making money for other people. Mm -hmm. And I think that is probably the seed of being somebody who wanted to start their own business. Yeah. Well, 25K a month, you know, for anyone in any position is pretty... Decent. That's a massive yeah, risk. Certainly is at 29 years old. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, but I spent it. <laughs> I to get it's through really it. Good, yeah. <laughs> no, you know what? I, I think I, um, I had a wonderful period at that time of my yeah. life. I mean, we were traveling a lot. Um, I bought my first car. I bought my first house. So you and Bon are serious at this stage? Yeah, I mean, we'd, we'd <laughs> quite funny, actually. She wouldn't let me move into her apartment. Right. So I bought the flat next door. <laughs> so, <laughs> because I thought I'd just move in with her. And she said, no, because I have, I have my life here. You know. So I bought the flat next door. Quite a funny story, actually. She was, uh, she was the stylist for Take That at the time. Oh, awesome. well, all the guys from Take That used to stay at her apartment. They're in London. And, and, um, you know, and Jason Orange, part one of the band, also wanted to buy the flat next door. But I, I thought he quite fancied my wife. So I thought I'd better buy it <laughs> in case they got too close. So I ended up living next door, yeah. So, but it was great. And then eventually, a year, a year or two later, we bought an apartment and moved in together, yeah. Okay, never looked back since? No, no, not at all actually. I got married on my 30th birthday and I'm 48 now, so yeah. Wow, I don't like a day of 47. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> Coming up with a big 5 soon. Yeah. <laughs> well, it'll be a good party anyway. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you're in the job, you're mm. doing well, you've bought Jason Orange's apartment from underneath him. <laughs> yeah, because I've um, done you. <laughs> and then you decide to risk all that by Going in part yeah, I think what happened, that was probably the first really big risk I took. Um, bumped into a guy in a car park, fairly well documented now, you know, I had a brand new Aston Martin, thought I was a bit of a rock star. Yeah. Picked it up the same day the Prodigy picked up theirs, you know, I was, <laughs> I was moving and shaking in London. Um, and this guy literally just walked up to me and he said, you know, cool car, you know, what do you do? You're a trader. And I said, no, I work in recruitment. And he said, so do I. He said, I've just sold my business, but I'm going to set something up. I've got funding. Big, right. big check then. You got four and a half million quid from a PE house. Right. And for a pure startup, <clears throat> 1999 this was. Um, Isn't this 
Isn't this a scene from Wolf of Wall Street? He probably is now. <laughs> Doesn't Jeremy Hill's character come up to Leonardo DiCaprio and go, nice car? Does he? Business? I didn't, I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. Oh, right. yeah. I did it first. Well, Leonardo who? Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, well, anyway, we, we set Huntress up yeah. and that company then went to 100 million turnover. Yeah. Awesome. And was sorry. I mean, it's interesting actually, we started that business just before the tech crash yeah. and just before 9-11 hit. And I gotta say, that was pretty brutal. We, we set the business up at the top of the market yeah. and then had to run a startup in, in a trench, you know, and, and that was pretty hard going. Yeah. Learn a lot from that. And then I guess I guess a big difference there is you were previously a bit of a one man band, I guess, yeah. in the recruitment, and yeah. all of a sudden you've got lots of people yeah, left I think to lead. I, I learned a lot. I mean, we built that company to 500 staff quite quickly. And I was looking after, you know, 150, 180 people in my bit of it, if you like. Really? Okay. So I learned quite quickly um, how to sort of hire and manage and, and, and look after and run teams of people and, and build a business from scratch. I mean, it was when I look back, my God, we had some challenges. You know, we were always on the edge yeah. as far as the growth versus running out of money. and. yeah. yeah financing a fast growing business and yeah it was and, and also we didn't really get on as a board it was quite a challenge because we all were running in different directions and yeah when i look back i, I, I definitely couldn't do it now it was really hard work yeah and it was um, just learning on the job it wasn't yeah i had, no, I had no experience yeah i was good at the, the technicalities of doing a recruitment job but i had no idea how to run a business okay so yeah naive naive too naive actually because i didn't take enough equity i took salary instead and looking back equity was just so valuable in the end. Yeah. Um, but hey, lesson learned. Yeah. So what what happened with Huntress then in the? the so Huntress was sold. Um, <clears throat> timing wise, I mean, it was quite extraordinary. It was three weeks before the global economy crashed. Oh wow! And in fact, a guy from the PE part of the bank that bought us, mm. um, his boss told him not to do the deal, and he went ahead and did it. And then three weeks later, literally, Lehman's went. The whole economy just literally crashed. Wow. Um, but we stood the business through. It went from 100 million turnover to 60 million. So we took a, a fairly big dent. Okay. We, yeah, we lost probably a third of our staff. Um, and but we steered the business through the recession. Mm -hmm. And then as it started to pull out of the recession, I felt my work had been done. I mean, been there eight years, yeah. literally, Nick, non-stop. You know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I can't tell you how hard we worked. And I think I was a bit frazzled, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know what? I took some money off the table. I had, did an earn out, which mm -hmm. I successfully completed. And I just woke up one day and thought, I just, I just don't want to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, I had a great big house, had loads of cars, had a great income. So tell us about that then. So, <laughs> so the flat next to Bon is one thing, where he bought it from under Jason Orange. But yeah. I believe when we talked before, there was there were a few toys. <laughs> <laughs> so talk us through it. Do you, do you go and pick just up built up. You know what? Say, yeah, I mean, oh gosh, yeah. What do you do in that first big check land? Well, the first thing you do is you phone up your bank and you ask them what your balance is. And you put, <laughs> yeah. and you put them on speakerphone and sort of smugly laugh to yourself. And you say, sorry, could you say that again? Um, and yeah, I mean, you just, when you have, you have sometimes you're going to have a lot of income, but you never have a really big lump of money yeah. unless you inherit it um, or win the lottery. And when you get it, it's sort of a little bit daunting. Mm -hmm. um, the first thing I did was bought Country Life and bought the biggest yeah, house I could find. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just, it's sort of, it's it's just like a classic <laughs> sort of, you know, slightly nouveau riche thing to do. But I always wanted it. I've read Country Life since I was a kid looking at all these stately oh, homes. Really? That's yeah. interesting. And my dad used to drag me around all of these stately homes on a Sunday. Right. So I, you know, I lived in Downton Abbey for every weekend in my head. And so when it came to it, I thought, I'm going to buy a great big house. Stupidly thought, didn't think for a minute the complications of a large house. Mm. Um, and also I bought a weekend house. I mean, I was only there for the weekend. I didn't even live in it. So we'd sort of turn up on a Friday night from, from, from London to this gigantic great big manor house that was freezing cold with eight fire blazers, yeah. you know. You my my wife would say, light the fires. And like, light the fires, there's eight of them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I didn't have that much money. I couldn't afford, you know, staff and all that kind of stuff. Mm. But I did what normal people do. Is just, and I bought loads of cars as well. I'm a complete petrol head. Yeah. So I just went out and bought lots of sort of classic Toys. cars. Yeah. Uh, funny enough, I, I, they, they were they, they're pretty good investments. But... Um, yeah, so yeah, I just did, just went a bit crazy really. But really enjoyed it, I felt I deserved it. You know, yeah. I, I, I didn't think, so I was still young, I was only 
I was 35 years old. So I didn't care that much about the future. It wasn't, it wasn't like a pot of money that I had to make, that I had to make last. Mm. I, I could earn more. I was so yeah. confident in the ability. So yeah, that's what I did. And were you one of those um, employees, children, that had a Ferrari on the wall and a poster or whatever? 100%, yeah. Fine. So he was on the desk as well. That was the drive to get to I that. think those formative years of your youth, mm. I mean, for me, growing up in the 80s, Thatcher, you know, I'm one of Thatcher's children. I went and I went through the whole kind of poll tax thing, the, the 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 acid house movement. You know, I've been through that era in the '80s, and part of that growing up was the picture of the Lamborghini on the wall, yeah. was the picture of the Ferrari 328 GTS. You know, <laughs> and you had the model of it. You know, and yeah, cool. So when you can afford to actually buy these things, it becomes a bit of a shock and somewhat gratifying actually. Yeah. So what were, your, what were your parents like then if your dad was driving you around stately homes? Was he quite a modest background? Or he... Yeah, modest. I mean, he was fiercely intelligent academically. Um, and he was, we, we were middle class. You know, we had a, a nice house or we had a, a, a nice living. You know, I don't think it was... I don't, I don't look back at anything other than relatively halcyon times. Mm. Unfortunately, my, my parents split up when I was about 15. Right. Um, so they went their separate ways. Um, but by that time, I, I just... I just moved on into youth culture and wasn't really that interested. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, but my actual upbringing up until that point was, you know, we lived in a great village with a great life, you know, okay. nothing. You know, okay. But the, uh, yeah, but the stately homes made you want your own. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always fantasised about living in a big house. Yeah. I, I definitely wouldn't do it now though. I think, I think it's a, it's a scratch that I needed to itch, but I, I, I wouldn't do it again. Yeah. And I think we talked before, Bon was quite excited, wasn't she? Because she's got a bit of an eye for, a bit of an eye for interiors. Yeah. <laughs> a bit of an obsession with interiors. Yeah, I think we had, we had a lot of fun with that house. I mean, the house was owned by an American and he'd, he'd sort of done a version of what he thought an English house looked like, but it was a bit pastiche. So we ripped the whole thing out and started again. Right. And Bon was amazing. Yeah, I mean, we had this huge ballroom and I remember her saying, we're going to put fabric on the walls. And I thought, oh, well, that's quite interesting. Mm. Where are we going to get that from? She said, Venice. And I went, oh, okay. that sounds expensive. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we did up the house and actually to her credit, I mean, we literally got to the last room and there were a lot of them. And I said, we're selling. On the last room? Yeah. And what did her face do? Uh, yeah, the there, was a, there was a marked disappointment. <laughs> but to be, as I say to, to her credit, she said, you know, you're obviously not happy. What do you want to do? I said, I'm, I'm going to start again. All of this, everything around us has to go because I've got to get back in the zone and we just need to sort of pile up cash in order to have no income. And I think a lot of people, a lot of people, most of my friends thought I was completely insane. Yeah. Um, I mean, like, but I just, I, for me, it wasn't a case of, I just couldn't, I just didn't want to do it anymore. And was it the, was it, what was the balance of needing the cash and needing the headspace or the drive, I guess, if you see what um, I mean? Yeah, I didn't, I, um, I, I don't think I thought about it that much. I, I just knew that I needed, I didn't calculate, I didn't put it down on paper. Right. You know, I didn't sit there with a calculator and say, right, we need this amount per month for this. I mean, you know me well enough <laughs> yeah, to know exactly. that I don't do that. <laughs> I was wondering. Yeah, <laughs> so I just thought, right, let's liquidate. Yeah. Let's get back to thinking we have no money. Okay. Um, let's concentrate on work, not life style, which I think is one of the traps you fall into with work. Yeah. Um, and start again, but it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't a, um, detailed calculation it was a feeling actually is what it was okay but at the same time you know Sir Peter Ogden had phoned me up and he'd said you know let's do something and you rarely get that call in life I mean you just they just you don't, don't have many of those calls no you've had a car park encounter yeah yeah that was, one, that was one that was one <laughs> yeah. they're, they're sliding doors moments yeah. you know they really are and I don't I think you, you have to really seriously sit there and think to yourself this is not going to happen very often do I take advantage of it or not and when he phoned up and said let's do something I'll back you I, I really didn't need a second phone call for that. Yeah. You so, know. so, I think people would be interested to hear about that. Yeah. Just how does you know just get the call? What? How? Did no. It I, uh, so for many many years I employed his son, and right. uh, Peter um, is a wonderful, wonderfully successful, intelligent individual, and he's very northern in his attitude. <laughs> right, okay. So he said to his son, "Is that a good know, thing?" Yeah, it is a good thing because you know what they're very very down to earth people. Yeah even though they live in this stratosphere of ultra wealth, mm. um, he said to his son, go and get a job. You know, yeah. you, you may have this trust fund with 
gazillions of pounds in it, but you need to go out and earn a living. So he came and worked for me at Huntress. Yeah. And he was good, you know, he worked hard, he was young, and we only found out later that his father was Sir Peter Ogden. Oh, wow. He got quite a lot of stick for it, actually. <laughs> um, bless him. And, uh, but he, yeah, so, and then we tried to get Sir Peter to be our non-exec. He wasn't interested, but then he was very interested in what I was doing. And I think when we sold and I left, mm. I think he very quickly took advantage of that situation and thought, okay. I'm going to back this guy because I think he's really good. And I felt I was quite young and probably at the peak of my career. Okay. So, so you managed to get, the company was called Spencer Ogden. It was. So you managed, is, to, yeah. you managed to not have Ogden Spencer. Do you know what, it's so funny, Nick. When, when it, we thought we'd play a little joke on Peter. So yeah. when we did the branding for it, we said, right, we're going to call it Spencer Ogden because Ogden Spencer doesn't sound very good. And he yeah. was like, yeah. And we had the branding guys <laughs> do, do this massive Spencer and this tiny little Ogden <laughs> next to it. And we said, and this is what the branding's going to look like. And he went, <laughs> what you're funny. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. <That's cool. laughs> so yeah, in the end, uh, Spencer Ogden, we set it up um, in 2010. And yeah, I mean, wow, we just... What did it do and why did you... So Spencer Ogden was, was another recruitment company, but this time instead of doing technology, I went into energy. I thought for two reasons, really. One, I was restricted to go into the wire. I couldn't compete yeah. for two and a half years. Yeah. You know, when you do a big transaction and you have a shareholders agreement that says you have a non-compete, they have teeth, you know, you can't you can't circumnavigate those mm-hmm. like you can with some uh, contracts of employment. So Peter came along and he said, what do you want to do? I said, well, geographically, I can go more or less anywhere, but I can't work in the UK in the same industry. But I think there's a huge opportunity in energy. Energy recruiters were like a mafia, old companies that have grown very, very big in a billion turnovers, but not that many of them. And there have been no new startups in the industry. And oil price started to move quite quickly up. And there was renewable energy and and nuclear and stuff like that. So I thought, right, let's, let's, let's go into this. I didn't know anything about it at all. Um, so I hired 27 people on the first day who all had experience in their niches. I spent three months headhunting. And then we started it. And in the first year, I mean, we did we did 1.6 million in fees in the first year. Um, that company went to 100 million very quickly. Yeah. I mean, we grew across the world. Peter funded it. I did the same thing, just worked like crazy to build that business. And we opened up... Um, yeah, a lot of offices, and we and we built that company, and now that company, you know, they're still in a million a month EBITDA. I mean, it's a big business now, yeah. you know, a really big business, and it employs a lot of people in a very technical environment. So yeah, that was the second one. But this was the second one was really yours. I get the impression you obviously had the back of yeah. Advice, I really felt yeah. I felt ownership. You know, I mean, I did a very straight deal with Peter. It was fifty yeah. fifty. You know, I mean, the joke was that I worked fifty hours a week. He worked fifty hours a year, <laughs> but he wrote some pretty big checks. Yeah. And it was a brilliant partnership. We never argued. We never disagreed on anything. Um, and we worked, you know, well together in that in that sort of mechanic where he, he funded the growth and I and I ran the business. But for sure, that was my business. I yeah. felt I felt absolutely in control of it. Um, right up until the point again where, where I felt I'd, I'd done what I needed to do and got it as far as I could. Yeah. And how do you how do you grow that quickly? Is it is it cult of personality? Is it is it good hiring? Is it it's, it's a culture? Lot, it's a lot of different things. Yeah. I mean, you have to be absolutely focused and single minded. And let me tell you, people do not like Business is growing that quick. Mm. Certainly, banks don't like it. Yeah. I remember having a meeting with RBS. And they said you're over trading, and I was like, "Yay, we're over trading!" <laughs> and they went, "No, no, no, you're going to run out of money." Right. I said, "We're not, <laughs> because we got Sir Peter Ogden behind us." Yeah. And they said, "Well, you're lucky you have, because most people haven't." Mm-hmm. And Peter was the one person who said to me, "Keep going, keep growing it. I'll fund the working capital. He said, I'll fund the growth capital." He said, "I'm not going to fund working capital." Because the business should be able to take care of itself, but I will, be, you know, just keep building it because we were on a wave. So I think single-minded focus, funding, all of those things came together like the planets aligned. Yeah. The, the market was building. We were taking people, business off our competitors. We were taking staff off of our competitors, yeah. and we were just on a mission. And I think that pulled us into this phenomenal trajectory. I mean, as you know, the Smith and Williamson Award, you know, I won Entrepreneur of the Year, yeah. Growth Business of the Year, Queen's Award. We're in the Sunday Times fast track six times. Yeah. I mean, getting in there once is tough. To get in there a second time, that means you've got to build, beat all the other startups. Yeah. 
six times. That's that's going some. Yeah, it's people about to get, growth. yeah, it's tough. So yeah, that was it was an amazing project. Well, whenever I, I guess when I used to come and visit you at those offices, it seemed like there was quite a lot of fun. Or something. Yeah, like we we a couple did, of people yeah. cycling around the grass. Yeah. <laughs> it we a, had, it was I guess crazy. when I look back, it was a relatively high octane sales environment mm. without being too boiler room. Mm. It definitely had a feeling that we were having a lot of fun. Yeah, we were working very very hard, and we were pretty hardcore sales people. Mm. Um, but also with this air of professional, so we had lots of trainers, we had lots of um, legals around us protecting as far as the, the legislation around um, mm -hmm. oil and gas was concerned. So it was a controlled environment. Somebody called it the best run frat house in the world, <laughs> which I sort of think was a compliment. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. But cut to, you know, when Goldman Sachs came along and tried to buy the business, mm. it was a big number as well, it was about 100 million. They were a little sort of it's slightly in awe of our ability to tame millennials yeah. into a into a into a funnel of, of focusness, but also slightly terrified with that environment. <laughs> uh, and you know, we had quite a few relatively racy conversations right. around culture. Okay, you know, will that culture fit with Goldman Sachs? And rather ironically, Goldman Sachs was sort of being sued for their own culture at the time. So the <laughs> conversations got quite surreal. <laughs> but it was, you know what, it was, it was, yes, when you came into that office, you knew it was a sales environment. Yeah. There was lots of activity. There was Bloomberg screens on. There yeah. was, you know, people riding around in bicycles playing table tennis. We created WeWork and Facebook. We created WeWork before WeWork. Yeah. Yeah, our offices were that model. And in fact, when WeWork came along, Peter said to me, oh, we should have done that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Messing around in recruitment, we yeah. could have built a $10 billion property company. It's <laughs> yeah. a good idea. Yeah. Do that one next. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so that's ticking along. Um, ticking along, what a stupid phrase. <laughs> that's it was ticking along, cool. Nick. <laughs> and then I'll always remember I came across to see you, um, I think just for a general catch up to yeah. how business was going. And you pulled out these marketing boards and said, I'm not doing that now. I'm in the water trade now. So that was a weird breakfast. Yeah. But tell us yeah, what was I going think, on. So the business was, was running well. Yeah. Um, I'm, a, I'm a great startup guy. Um, I, I really simply, I read an article in the newspaper, village in Italy, highest density of 100 year olds anywhere in the world. Scientists visit the village, think the differentiator is the fact they're eating rosemary. I mean, you read it in the newspaper, most people skipped over it, thought, interesting, note to self, try and eat more rosemary. Yeah. It haunted me for a while. <laughs> okay. It haunted me because I couldn't find anywhere that made a drink, because I wanted to drink it, not eat it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's when I just thought, you know what, I'm going to make this drink, because nobody else has ever made it. And the story was so compelling, so f sort of interesting. And I, <laughs> and I went to Peter, I said, Peter, I'm, I'm going to go and make a drink. And he can't, he, I've seen the look in so many people's <laughs> eyes, that look to say, oh, no. you are absolutely <laughs> mad. And he, but again, he was incredibly, he said, whatever you want to do, that's fine. I'm very disappointed. Um, I said, I need to sell some shares. He bought them, didn't want any other shareholders involved. And off I went. And I think, looking back, it's two and a half years ago now, that was pretty brave. Yeah. <laughs> Never made a drink before. Yeah. And it is very, very, very complicated. Yeah and we've raised a lot of money. I do think we have something so special, so utterly unique, that I feel that it is a very, very big beast, this one. Yeah, and I, and I think a totally different type of beast. Yeah. Whereas it's not about the numbers and what margin's on there, it's about building a feeling and a brand a bit more, I guess. It's more brand, I mean, you know, obviously turnover and profit are important in yeah. any business, and scale is important. But I think for what we're trying to achieve, the brand and the concept is the value to a significantly bigger company than we are. Yeah. A large drinks company could take our concept and create a billion dollar brand quite quickly because, mm -hmm. because nobody else has done it before. Yeah. It's utterly unique. All drinks are moving towards functional drinks. All drinks are moving away from plastic. They're moving you know, without additives. And functional drinks are the, are, the, are the key word across the world. People want their drinks to do something. Yeah. We've created the ultimate functional drinks range with Kew Gardens, with science. I mean, yeah, I mean, I would say it's just mine, but it is brilliant. Yeah. 
So, what next after that one? There is Are no you, next after this. There's no next after that. I, I genuinely think three is enough. Um, I will take this business to the point where somebody else, probably a grown up, needs to run it. <laughs> 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 For the simple reason, it's incredibly complicated. Yeah. You know, this is not this is not a, a, a play thing. This is a very serious business, mm. and I think I'm not getting any younger either. And, and while I used to jump out of bed at six o'clock in the morning, I can't jump out of bed at eight o'clock in the morning now. Yeah. So I think, and also my wife is is a lot older than I am. We want to spend some time together. Yeah. So for me, you know, a five every all of these projects end up. They end up eight years when I started to try and do it in five, but I think this will end up five to seven years. A good trade sale because I think it deserves to be in the hands of a big drinks company. Yeah. Um, and then I'm going to go and be a farmer in Ibiza. Tell us about your farm. <laughs> I bought a farm. I bought a farm in Ibiza. Um, I, I, do you know what? I've, I've, funny, I've got a farm in Gloucestershire as well. I didn't mean to be a farmer, I didn't know I'd go out <laughs> consciously to be a farmer, but I really, really, really enjoy nature food, growing food, watching the seasons. Um, I mean, what we're doing now, botanicals. I just, do you know what? I really, really love it. And I think it gives me a lot of um, peace and harmony in my life. And you've got a nice retreat. It's, yeah, it's like, yeah, it's like a compound. <laughs> <laughs> Come the apocalypse, we yeah. have water, food, power, all off grid. Yeah, I mean, don't, it's an off, it's an off grid farm. And yeah. don't reveal its location. There won't be a link to its location. Nobody knows where it is. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> no, us, but I'm, 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 I'm very happy. Tell us what a day in the day in the life's like when you're in the retreat. A day in the life in the tree. Oh, the tree you know, retreat. Yeah. So I get up, probably check the solar still working, so I can you know power the farm. Um, go to the vegetable patch. Get some fruit, have breakfast, probably work out on the farm. There's an awful lot of work to do on the farm. It's never ending, which I love because it will just go on forever. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, maybe go out and have lunch by the beach somewhere, come back, have a snooze. <laughs> but, um, I'm probably quite different from what's the day in life in London then? Oh my God. <laughs> meetings after meetings yeah. after meetings oh, after meetings. Yeah, yeah. Shows. Oh, you know, I've got to go to places like Luton to look at the production or Milton Keynes, you know, and. Yeah. Uh, then I have to look at the, you know, the nice bits, which is the marketing, and then you've got to check you know, stock, and then you've got to make sure you've got enough of everything, then you've got to drive sales, you've got to talk to customers, you've got to make sure your rate of sales good, you've got to make sure you've got enough water. I mean, just a million different spinning plates. Yeah, so you need the farm. You need the farm. <laughs> you need the farm. <laughs> I think on that note, I think we're going to wrap up there, David. Great. Thank you very much. Particularly for being the first. <laughs> number one. Yeah, number one. Number one. Um, and David features in our Hall of Fame. There'll be a link to that for an abridged version of his story. Um, and thank you for being so Thanks, open Nick. and honest. No problem at all. Great Cheers. to see you. Thank you, David, from number one, Rosemary Water, for your valued contribution. And thanks, listeners, for tuning in. All of the references will be on the episode, um, and you can click on links from them. Please, if you like what we're doing, rate and review and forward and share. And hopefully we'll see you next time. Thank you. This SW The Pulse podcast is of general nature and is not a substitute for professional advice. No responsibility can be accepted for the consequences of any action taken or refrained from as a result of what is said. The views expressed are not necessarily those of the presenter or of Smith & Williamson or any of its affiliates. No reproduction of this podcast may be made in whole or in part for professional or recreational purposes. No action should be taken based on this podcast and we accept no liability if we change your views on any of the subjects mentioned.